Okay. Oh, Hello, sorry. everyone. We are recording. Mm -hmm. This is Diane, no. your Zoom room host. The workshop we have this afternoon is the Money Power Revolution from Private Debt to Public Money. Presenters are Joe Bongiovanni, Sue Peters, Mary Sanderson, and Howard Switzer. We, uh, there's more information and bios on the GPUS convention website, so please visit there. And I believe there's also a link to workshop materials. So welcome everyone and we shall begin. Yes, good afternoon. This is Mary. I want to welcome you too on behalf of the BMRC. Welcome everyone to the Green Party U.S. 2020 live installment of the interactive epic novel of money and power in which we live. We welcome everyone who comes simply curious about money and power because a main goal of the BMRC is to raise monetary literacy in the mainstream. For that same reason, we're grateful that so many delegates participated in the heated discussion on the Lumio platform this week about money systems and our revolutionary Green Party plank. We welcome Greens who are stuck on MMT too. Their staunch defense of the Federal Reserve System is a great curiosity to us. What, we wonder, brings Greens to protect the fox in the hen house? Upshot, everyone's views are welcome and we welcome the heat as a natural consequence of challenging the almighty banking system in a bid for a viable future. Two main items to report on our activity this year. Careful deliberations went, in, went into updating and clarifying the monetary plank. We encourage you all to read and get familiar with it. And Eugene inspired us to start a little newsletter. He is going to put the link into the chat box right now, and we hope you all will click on it to stay in closer touch with this work. Now, the nuts and bolts of today's workshop. We are so lucky to have Joe, Sue, and Howard as presenters again this year. Their years of studying the history of money and power all together add up to about 80. We plan to keep at least 20 minutes for your questions, so please type them into the chat box. It's okay to direct questions to a certain speaker or not. Rita will pick the most helpful and the juiciest of the questions to answer first, but we are all happy to stay over time to get to your question if necessary. Joe is gonna be our first speaker. He's from the Green Party of Virginia, and he's a second generation monetary reformer, studying money systems with his father for over 40 years. Joe serves on the board of the Coventry Clean Energy Corporation, and he's co-founder and director of the Kettle Pond Institute for Debt-Free Money in Vermont. Joe is also on the board of directors of the Alliance for Just Money, and he chairs its legal action committee. Joe's deep background in money system understandings makes him an outspoken leader of this modern movement for public money. Go ahead, Joe. Well, thanks a lot, Mary, for that introduction. Um, and to good afternoon to all the people who are here, um, uh, listening in, participating. It's so, it's so great as an opportunity that the Green Party provides to us to be able to, to have a discussion about what I personally think is the most important issue, the hinge pin issue, the link issue, to make a change in our society, and that is who creates and issues the money. So today, I'm, uh, I'm, gonna st I'm starting off with uh, two keywords, maybe three. <clears throat> One of them is contained in this slide. It's given by the person who for a lot of people and maybe a lot of greens consider the master social visionary and that word is opportunity. 
So to me, my word is opportunity. That Karl Marx said revolution is 90% opportunity could be questionable, but my dad told me that, so I believed him. And I let it guide me, as he, as he also said, you will get the opportunity that I never had, because my dad was during that great moderation of, uh, of, of economics, not what we have today. <clears throat> the second word is a turnoff to a lot of green people, one we rarely engage in reality, maybe for its confusion. That word is capitalism. <clears throat> and when I say capitalism, I mean capitalism. So the month is July, the year is 2020, the Green Party of the United States have in its annual national meeting. But well, where are we? Amidst a global pandemic where gatherings like an annual meeting itself are forbidden. And so for us Greens working on monetary reform in the nation's banking and money systems, we're in, we're in Wisconsin, in Tennessee, in Manhattan, and in Virginia's Eastern Shore at home. It's July 2020. It's a good time for another monetary revolution in America. A good time to call for revolutionary arms, arms that embrace the self-evident truth we're gonna discuss of capitalism's abject debt for money failures. Today, the people want their money back. In a deeper Green New Deal sense, the people need their money back because we can't get there without that power. Through the Green Party's greening the dollar, people's money solution, we can achieve the change we need. Today, we hold these truths dear and evident that there's our planet's ecology, it needs to be sustained, our societal equity, it needs to be gained. And there's the Green New Deal it needs doing right now. But we need to declare our independence from the capitalists and capitalism's money power. We need our money back. So what then is this money power that we want a revolution over? That we need a revolution over? It's not merely the great powers to create and issue the nation's money. It's important to understand it's not merely that, creating and issuing the money. It is that, but it importantly includes the real political economic powers. One is to determine where our money is first spent. Will it go to the military? Will it continue to go to private equity debt bubbles? Or will it be rebuilding our infrastructure? And more importantly still, as the power, who gains from that first use of dollar money that is created and issued? Is it a public gain or is it a private gain? Those are the things associated with the fork in the road of money power. The 1% today create and issue all our money. They determine what wealth and where that wealth is created and by whom. And then the 1% gain that wealth for themselves, 95% of it over the last 10 years. The rich get richer here and the poor get the picture. Today, all money power is with the private banks and they use their special power to determine what the capital development of the economy looks like. This is their capital development, look around. This is capitalism, capitalism. Our world is the capital development of the national economy by the private bankers using their debt-based money power. This is it. Debt saturated, income starved, broad and deep human suffering everywhere you look, these are the results with their only promise ahead of more public austerity. <clears throat> when I have the liberty to quote Thomas Jefferson, 
a known monetary revolutionist as am I, even if perhaps he was also otherwise a rogue in character. I hope not me. The American people ever allow private banks to control the issuance of, issuance of, their, of their currency because currency was all of their money. First by inflation and then by deflation, the banks and the corporations that will grow up around them will deprive the people of all property until their children wake up homeless on the continent their fathers conquered. Look around. We hold these truths that thanks to winning their war for monetary independence, our people today have the right to whatever form of money system that is needed. That's important. We have the right under our constitutional provisions, Article 1, Section 8, Clause 5, the people's money. We have the right to our people's money. America's first war over money is won, was won. Well done, America. Let it not be in vain. We hold these truths that the people have the right to take their money power and their money system back from the 1% who stole it from the people with a pen back in 1913 and who gave us the so-called Federal Reserve Bankers money system. We hold this, this truth to be self-evident that the naturally caring progressive American people today given the choice, would reject the further use of anything except real government-issued money to pay for our achieving our Green Party vision that's in our platform, that of an equitably shared national prosperity with a more cooperative and harmonious social, co social coexistence in every respect. We hold these truths to be self-evident. Embracing and acting upon these truths is what our call for revolutionary arms is all about. Embracing and acting on these truths. We need another people's money revolution in America, and we need it now, because we can't get there from here. We can't get to the Green New Deal without the money power. The eco-socialists can't get there from here. The Occupy Wall Streeters can't get there from here. The Black Lives Matters of our brothers and sisters, they can't achieve what matters without our public money revolution. The banker's money today, there's the usury. If we stick with the banker's money power, then we would be forced through the borrowing and then compounding the interest. I need to say this, we pay compounding interest on every dollar that has ever been created in our money system. Compounding interest on every dollar in perpetuity. That's capitalism. Through compounding interest, we'd have to pay between two and three times over for each of the critical social, economic, and environmental gains that need doing right now. It is and will remain impossible to achieve those gains for the common. Just as Jefferson warned, without taking the money power back from the usurists who are actually in charge of our government and of our nation. It's our job to do it because we're here. The critical society, the critical societal gains provided in the policy platform of the Green Party is where the essential progressive agenda of today is presented and found. Seeking those gains is again why the people want their money back. That we might indeed achieve our peace amid prosperity without resort to any more debt, public or private, than might be necessary. After the revolution, there will be no need for more debt in order to have more money. None. This is just as called for in our Greening the Dollar program. Our demand is for constitutional people's money power that we the people can pay for all our dreams 
but only once. This is our 2020 predicament. Our planet is in peril, deeping social inequities that become unreachable in the, in the pandemic. There's a growth imperative for more debt created with every loan of debt-based money. They create more debt than they create money. They need to create more debt to pay the, to pay the interest on the debt. The Green Party's seeking of sustainable energy, economy, eco ecology, interrelationships commands a new kind of people's money, the kind that's called greening the dollar in the Green Party platform. How then will this political, social, economic green revolution be financed? With real money, as the, G as the Green Party platform demands, as proposed by Dennis Kucinich, 2011 under the National Emergency Employment Defense Act bill, the 112th Congress, the nationalization of our money system, a taking by the people of our money system back from the bankers with the pen. Three concurrent socially liberating enhancements are at play in the Kucinich bill and in our platform that of using public money power to purchase all the Fed's assets, so we're gonna take the Fed and put it under Treasury. That of empowering the Treasury to issue all new United States money by spending that money directly into circulation using the government's budgeting and spending process. Ironically, that's what MMT says we do now. Interesting that we, that we need to have a law change in order to actually do it. But there's also the kicker to the capitalism's debt money as we know it. The third change is the one that stops the banks from issuing money, any of our United States money at ends fractional reserve banking and thereby prevents the 1% bankers from invoking their outlandish privilege of determining the capital development of our national economy, of determining where new money is spent and determining who profits from that spending ever again. Capitalism as it exists today will be turned on its uncaring head. Government will do creation, circulation, and administration of our people's real money. And the American people will be back in charge of themselves and their money come. The second American Revolution will be ours if we, if we command it. Change the money. Revolution is enabled. Economic and democracy are at hand. 2020 is the time for revolutionary arms and hands for the embracing and the potential of our national money power. Change and for making that change happen. It's our money system and we're only paying once. Hashtag, pay just once, Green Party. To the ramparts, Green Party, to the ramparts. Let's take it with us. Thank you. Yeah, sparkles for Joel. Thank you very much. Good. I got unmuted and I'm going to tell you a little bit who is Sue Peters before she starts her part of the presentation. Mary, can you put a uh Joe's presentation down and I'll put mine up while you're talking. Yes, thank you. Thank you for reminding me. Sure. Yeah. Sue Peters is a Green Party member of New York and a member of the Banking and Monetary Reform Committee. She's had a 37 year career in technology. Her last 17 years was spent working for a Wall Street bank. She's been an active member of several monetary reform groups. She's given many public talks on the subject and spent over two years teaching a class about the book, The Lost Science of Money by Stephen Zarlenga. Last spring, Sue spent five months researching and writing a paper on the topic, Debt Drives War and War Drives Debt, soon to be up on the website of the American Monetary Institute. Go ahead, Sue. Okay, I'm just um, 
I'm going to share my screen. I'm clicking on my slideshow. And then I'm clicking on share. You see it? Yep. Yes. Okay. Now, I just have to make it into full screen. I'm not sure how to do that. Ah, is it there? Yes. Oh, thank God. Okay. <laughs> okay, everybody. So glad to be here with the Green Party, um, with so many of you in this really time of great stress and, and pain for people. A lot of pain. Um, and I'm glad to be able to give some information to you um, about how this system works, this monetary system, private monetary system. Um, okay. So we're going to talk about private bank credit, which is where the power is. That's where the money power is, and it's been privatized. Then we're going to talk about the private Federal Reserve banks and some of who they are and their history of how they stole our money power from our government slowly over time and took it away. So now today our government can only tax and borrow and be in debt. And then a little bit about the CARES Act, how the Federal Reserve Banks and their member commercial banks are bailing out their friends, the 99%, and leaving us with debt. Okay. Private bank credit. Only the government that issues its country's money can promote the general welfare. You can't promote it with debt. Did you lose your home in 2008? Did you go into debt to pay for medical expenses? Do you have student debt you can't pay? Is the bank about to take your car but you lost your job and you can't make payments? Is your business facing bankruptcy? Our government does not issue our money. That's why all of this is happening. Our, our nation does not have a money supply. We have a credit supply, a debt supply. It's the means of exchange we all use is created by private bank loans, profiting the banks. It's hard to believe, very hard to believe, but very true, you can read the source materials, they're all there. <laughs> this is usury. Commercial banks have the legal power, the pa money power, the power to create money is in, found in the law of the nation. They have the legal power to create a deposit in the borrower's account. They create the deposit. They don't take money from one account and put it in the borrower's account or the loan. No commercial bank does that. So here's our banker with our borrowers. The borrower always has to sign a loan contract, which becomes a financial asset to that bank. Okay. And the bank creates the deposit in the borrower's account. It's called bank credit. All of those loans made by commercial banks create what we, we use as, quote, money supply. It's really a bank credit supply. It's all debt. All debt, think of it. Our whole money supply we depend on every single day is earning interest to private banks. This is our system. It's very hard to believe, but we're not taught about it. As the loan, now this is another feature. <laughs> As the loan is repaid to the bank, right? The bank credit disappears off, off, off the, uh, the balance sheet of the bank. Poof. 
So the money, su money supply shrinks. We must continuously be in debt to have a means of payment or else we won't have money like in the Great Depression of the 30s. People couldn't find money. Uh-oh. But who created all the interest that we have to pay on our money supply? Where does the interest come from? Now, remember this system has been created by people. People who want to make profit. People who want to be at the top of the mountain. Okay? The interest isn't created by the bank. It's not in our money supply. Why is the interest never created? Why did they design the system like this? Yeah, what's going on? Ah, I see. It makes money scarce not to create the interest. So we need to go to the bank for more loans and they can make more money. The system is the world's best kept secret. I just want to just reiterate, this is the power, the money power that has been privatized in the commercial banks, okay? Does this sound like a money system that promotes the general welfare? No. This is the result. We have the 99% and the 1%. Total inequality in our country. Now I want to tell you a little bit of the history of how the, the government's constitutional power to create our money for the general welfare was stolen from us legally over time. Okay, first I want to tell you that the 12 Federal Reserve Banks are all privately owned. This is a report from 2006 uh, from the New York Fed. And it tells all of the 121 commercial banks that own all of the shares in the New York Fed. They're the only ones that own the shares. The total shares in 2006 was 74 million shares of which you can see at the bottom there with the blue arrow, JP Morgan Chase owned half of the New York Fed, was half owner, okay? And I can distribute the full report. You can see the other Wall Street banks like Citibank with 23% of the shares. There was, there's been court cases. Here's a 1982 court case that said, Federal Reserve Banks are not federal instrumentalities. Their control is exercised by their board of directors. They receive no funds from Congress. They're empowered to sue and be sued in their own names and to hire and fire their own employees. In addition, I just learned this, in 2001, in the USA Patriot Act, there was a, a modification of the Federal Reserve Law. They added a new section that bestowed on the 12 regional Federal Reserve Banks domestic policing powers. The system has its own police academies, patch and badges, uniforms, pistol, rifles, police car, and they have been, this private police force has been given the power to arrest coast to coast without a warrant. Pretty freaky. So let's see how our government issued money, which was in our colonies, which was in our uh, revolutionary Congress, and was in the beginning of our country, how it was taken away from us. First of all, government issued money is authorized by Congress, issued and spent by a US Treasury, has no debt associated with it, it's accepted for all payments of debts, and it, has, it's, it creates a money supply that doesn't disappear when debt is repaid. Okay, so 
the Federal Reserve Banks, they have these reserves. What are reserves? Private commercial banks were chartered from the beginning of our country by state and, and national governments. They issued bank credit, right? What we learned about in the first part of this presentation. The laws required each bank of issue to keep a certain amount of government money. We have government money as a reserve in their vault because customers wanted that government money and they wanted to be able to take the bank notes or the bank deposits and say to their bank, okay, give me the cash, the government money. Member banks, the commercial banks that were members of the Federal Reserve, this is at the beginning of the Fed, right? The Fed comes in now. The member banks that joined the Fed, these are commercial banks that have the money power, were required to have an account at their Fed bank and store their reserves there. Remember, at that point, their reserves were government issued money, the money that people wanted in their hands, right? So all of that went into the Federal Reserve Banks in accounts for their, their members who owned the bank, right? We just saw that. So what did this Federal Reserve law in 1913, what powers did it give to these 12 Federal Reserve Banks? Number one, it gave these private banks, the private Fed banks, the power to issue an elastic currency. Okay, so these private banks are gonna issue a, a new currency and buy loan contracts. Remember the loan contracts that the banker always has the borrower sign? Yep. They, we call them bonds and debt securities. And so the Fed Bank can create this new currency and buy these loan contracts from their members or outside in the financial markets from investors. Um, and this comes in very handy when the member commercial banks and the financial markets are very, very upset and the value of their assets are going down, like today, it comes in very handy to save the 1%, the banks and the financial markets. The elastic currency, we know it as Federal Reserve Note. It is a debt of our government. It's issued by private Fed Reserve Banks, not our government. Legally, it's an obligation of the government. We're responsible for that. It's a government debt. It's not money, but a promise to pay the real money. And at the beginning of the Fed, the Fed banks had to back this currency with gold, right? Whoops. The Fed notes were slowly put into the hands of the people. Now look at those two notes. They look very similar. You see Benjamin, I think that's Benjamin Franklin, right? You know, but the one on the top, is an asset of our government. It's a gold certificate issued by our US Treasury without debt. The one on the bottom, oh, and that's money. That's real money. That uh, asset of US government, that gold certificate, that's the real money. The one on the bottom is a debt. It's a Federal Reserve note. It's an IOU. It's created by 12 private Federal Reserve banks. During the banking crisis of the 1930s, the Great Depression, the US went off the gold standard. Citizens were allowed to keep only $100 per person in gold coin or gold certificates. That was it. Everything else, everything else of the government money was exchanged for Federal Reserve notes, which became the legal tender. Federal Reserve notes had replaced government money in the hands of the people. The deposits representing the Fed notes replace government money in the reserve accounts of the member banks. The bank credit replaced our money. Okay, so that was a little history 
of how we got to the present and the powers that are in our commercial banks, the money powers there, and the power to, to bail out this debt system is in the Federal Reserve banks. Okay, so let's look at the CARES Act. In response to the stoppage of our economy, the U.S. Congress passed the CARES Act in March. In the CARES Act, Congress gives authority for the U.S. Treasury to give $450 billion to the Federal Reserve, to a private cartel, to give it to them. So we have the public U.S. Treasury, we have the private Federal Reserve, the U.S. Treasury doesn't create money, it only borrows or taxes. The $450 billion came from taxes and uh, treasury I'm bonds. What? Okay. Okay. The private Federal Reserve has power to create reserves for members and buy dodgy debt contracts. Remember 2008? Remember QE? what the Fed Bank will do, creating all of these facilities within itself. And I'm not gonna go through them, but um, <laughs> their uh, money market, uh, commercial paper, all of them. They're gonna create reserves and give the reserves, these facilities, all of these, are gonna create the reserves and give the reserves to the banks. What's going on? What will the commercial banks do with the money powers? Create bank credit, of course. Buy debt securities like municipal bonds, corporate bonds, exchange traded funds of corporate bonds, commercial paper, business loans from states, municipalities, businesses, corporations, investors, turnover, dodgy debt securities to the facility in the Fed can earn a lot of fees, a lot of fees. Everything is going through commercial banks. Bail out the corporations. Put government deeper in debt. What else are they going to do? They're going to create bank credit and give loans backed by this dodgy debt to banks, investment funds, hedge funds, private equity funds, mutual funds, Businesses, not small businesses, 15,000 employees, and issuers of securities backed by all of our consumer loans, auto, credit. Give dodgy debts to the facilities, because the banks don't want them, right? So that the, the, uh, all these dodgy debts are going back to the Fed and earn fees and bail out the corpse at the same time. So we're getting deeper into debt. And who's responsible for the dodgy debt? We are. We back the assets of the Federal Reserve Bank. Remember that Federal Reserve note is a debt to us. We are getting screwed all, with all the dodgy assets on the Fed's bank balance sheet to save their corporate friends. Forget the politicians. The politicians are put there to give you the idea that you have freedom of choice. You don't, you have no choice. You have owners. They own you with this money system. Thank you. Thank you, Sophie. Yeah. <clears throat> I hope so. people are. Uh, could you stop sharing, Sue? Yeah. <laughs> All right, thank you. Howard. Howard is Tennessee Green Party, an architect and an ecological system consultant. He ran for governor of Tennessee twice and for Congress once, and he co-founded the Moving the Money to Main Street campaign, which was adopted by the Green Party U.S. in 2007. Howard is a founding member of the Green Party of Tennessee, Green Party of the United States, and of the Banking and Monetary Reform Committee. 
Howard's is the last presentation, so go ahead and put more questions in the chat. Um, during the last, during Sue's talk, there was some background noise. If everyone would kindly mute themselves while they're not talking, it would be helpful. Go ahead, Howard. All right, so uh, we've uh, heard a lot of, uh, a lot of material here today, uh, probably a little hard to digest, so I'm, I'm uh, hoping that the recording will be available to you if you'd like to review some of it. But I'm going to kind of uh, try to bring it all together here and uh, talk about how we're going to pay for the world we want. But first I want to just mention some monetary theory. Because uh, I came across, uh, which is kind of what we've been talking about here, and I came across uh, the Stanford University Encyclopedia of Philosophy. And I looked under the philosophy of fee of money and found that they said there were just two theories of money. They were the commodity theory, where you use a commodity for money, like gold. And then there was the credit theory, where you use credit for money, which is uh, debt for money. And that was the only two theories they said that there were. And I'm thinking, well, how come there isn't a theory for using money as money? And so uh, that's kind of what we've been talking about, right? So that's been kept, kept from us, and I think that's an important uh, point. Uh, just to review some of the terms, monetary sovereignty is the power of a nation to exercise exclusive legal control over their own money. The sovereign was always the, uh, the ruler uh, and they had control of the money. And so that's what that uh, term refers to is the power over the money. Uh, money is an abstract social power embodied in law as a payment system. And the money power is the power of a nation to uh, create their own money or to create a nation's money if you're somebody else. <laughs> and usury is the abuse of money power for personal gain, which is pretty much what our whole banking system is about. And revolution is a fundamental and relatively sudden change in political power and political organization, typically due to perceived oppression or political incompetence, which I think we have in spades. Now, capitalism, as we've been learning, and, and uh, from my view, too, is that capitalism is the private control of the creation of money. And I say that because um, if you control the creation of money, you can own all of the means of production and everything else. <laughs> you can own whatever you want. In fact, you can even avoid the liabilities of ownership by indebting others to deal with those liabilities for you. And war debt has long been the richest profit center for the capitalist banks. And, and this is how they got control of governments, was governments going deep into debt to the banks and uh, to the point where the banks demanded control of their monetary system. So what does money have to do with revolution? Well, we're gonna find out. Uh, we stand on the shoulders of generations of giants and uh, this was one of them, John Kenneth Galbraith. He was a, a diplomat, economist, uh, kind of a f philosopher, a, uh, um, and an author. And uh, he said that the problem of the modern economy is not a failure of knowing economics, it's a failure of knowing history. So we're gonna take a look at a little bit of history, just briefly here, so uh, don't get scared, it's okay. Uh, we're going to talk about revolutions. And one of the early revolutions was in Greece. And in Greece, uh, there was a fellow named Lysurgis, and he was a member of the oligarchic family that ruled Sparta. And uh, he w went and traveled the world and came back and started sharing stories with uh, the people, and they just loved this guy. And so they revolted and demanded that he be made king. And so he was made king. And when he did, he outlawed, because he was the sovereign, he outlawed his families and the oligarchs' money. He outlawed gold and silver to be used as money and instead issued worthless ingots of iron, uh, pieces of iron, to be used for money. 
Now that may sound strange to you. How can you have a economy with worthless money? But it wasn't worthless because by law it was given value. And that's what money is, as Aristotle said, uh, it is a creature of the law. Uh, and so he issued these Pelinors and they created a prosperous economy for 325 years. It was so prosperous the Roman Republic had come over and saw it and uh, copied it for the Roman Republic and they had 400 years of prosperity. And this was all before they got into empire because when they got into empire, they had switched to gold. It was the oligarchs in power again. The Glorious Revolution, I don't know, you may not have heard of this one, <laughs> but this was the Glorious Revolution. It was capitalist funded. They funded the Dark Prince of William of Orange to depose King James, the Catholic king. And they had been, you know, uh, propaganding, uh, you know, sending propaganda over to England for a while to get people to uh, not like the Catholic king and prefer a Protestant king. And so that's how uh, it was a pretty easy revolution. And four years later, he uh, took the public money system and eliminated it and turned it all over to the privately owned Bank of England, which was owned by the capitalists who funded that revolution. Revolutions are about the money. The American Revolution, it too was about the money, as Ben Franklin told us. It was about the money. And, uh, and of course, it was because they had outlawed our money and then crashed the uh, uh, 13 colonies into a deep depression. So they revolted after 10 years of that and issued their own money and funded the revolution. And we won, as Joe was talking about. The French too. The French revolted and they also issued their own money to fund their revolution. And it was the assignat. And this was publicly issued money. And so revolutions are about the money. But 200 years later, Salvador Allende would say this about his revolution. We have won the revolution, but we have not won the power. And I want to talk about what that means. Because you see, the Continental and the Assignat, they were both attacked by the British. They were both attacked by the Bank of England, who had billions counterfeited of Assignats and Continentals to destroy their value. They were smuggled into the country and distributed around so that um, it would lower the value of the money of the revolutions. And so while they won their revolutions militarily, they lost their revolutions monetarily because the banks took the monetary power. And of course the French Revolution was to pose a sovereign leader, right? Who was already kind of beholden to the banks, but uh, the banks really wanted all the power. And so they got it. And so as John Adams would say, there are two ways to conquer and enslave a country. One is by sword and the other is by debt. Now we were familiar with the revolutions by sword, you know, the violent revolutions, military revolutions, but we're not very familiar with debt revolutions. You see, there are two kinds of revolutions and we're talking about the second kind of revolution, the revolution against debt and against debt money. As the famous historian Lord Acton would say, the issue which has swept down the centuries and which will have to be fought sooner or later is the people versus the banks. I, you know, we should be seeing that that's pretty true, you see, because <laughs> the new American revolution is, is uh, you know, bursting at the seams, it's ready to happen. And we're out in the streets and we've even identified where the power is, but we didn't know what the power was exactly. So there we were on the street, occupying Wall Street, the power, and we didn't know exactly what to do or what to demand. And that was unfortunate because there was a lot of effort to confuse people there. But here we are today. We're facing a protracted depression. I mean, that 
that is on the horizon. It looks like it could, could be happening. And all the uh, factors are out there. And environmental extremes we're experiencing. Small businesses are collapsing. While huge fortunes are made by the big businesses, they're making fortunes. Panic consumers stockpiling paper, food, and weapons. Ordinary commerce grinding to a halt. Racism and political factionalism growing more intense. A dysfunctional political system corrupted by big private money is incapable of an effective response. The conditions for revolution are being met, folks. But what's the government's response? This is Fed Chair Jerome Powell. He was asked by a congressman who uh, said that, uh, you know, we need, we need equity. We don't need debt. We need equity. And the chairman said, well, <laughs> that may be, but debt is what we do. <laughs> and that's the only response that we're getting from our government is more debt. Thanks a lot. Here's what we need. We need revolutionary money. The greenback. That was publicly issued debt-free money. And look, we can design our own money. You know, this is, this is their design. But, uh, you know, if we get public money, again, we can design new currency. But of course, the paper currency, you know, that's really a small part of the money supply these days. Most of it's electronic. We've even got the legislation to do this, as Joe explained, the NEED Act, it's ready to go. Uh, we might want to adjust the numbers a little bit in, in it before we pass it, but uh, we should do that. Of course, we'll have to elect a Congress to do that and probably an executive to sign it as well. But that's what the revolution is about, changing who's in power. The three reforms, just to go over that again, the Fed becomes part of our government, okay? And bank creation of money is stopped. And the US federal government creates and spends US money in, for the general welfare. They spend it on healthcare. They spend it on education. They spend it on investment in communities. For instance, the most oppressed communities. We should be doing reparations with public money because that would create a economic boom. People need money to spend. That's what makes an economy work. An economy is the exchange of goods and services and, you, and money is the uh, thing that facilitates that. So the people need money to facilitate the exchange of goods and services. And it should be put in at the bottom of the economy, not the top, because at the top, they just put it in their bank account. <laughs> you know, at the bottom, people spend it. At the, at the place where the raw materials come out of the ground, this is where it needs to be spent. In the communities that do the work, that produce the stuff, this is where it needs to be spent, okay? This, the, and this will eliminate the largest creator of economic hardship and poverty and inequity the world's ever known. Now what it does is it empowers the elected government to serve the public interest. Now they aren't having to do fundraising all the time. Now they're not having to think about how to get reelected all the time. They're empowered to serve the public interest. And so we can have dedicated community activists as our representative doing this. Fund healthcare and education, rebuild the infrastructure. We need a 24, 21st century build, uh, infrastructure, right? In the uh, NEED Act, there's 25% of new money goes to the states annually on a per capita basis. And this is so that uh, states and municipalities don't have to go into debt to, to serve their citizens. It's a tax-free dividend to every citizen. Yeah, right? You need to give people the money to make the economy go. And it ends compound interest, which we were talking about. It creates the massive inequity. And it pays off the national debt as it comes due, lowering those interest payments, which are like a half a trillion uh, per year right now. We're paying. And uh, it can do much more because anything physically possible, ecologically wise, and socially desirable is financially feasible. That is, it will not cause inflation or deflation. So what do we do now? Well, we've kind of educating the public. We're educating the electorate. And that's kind of what our national campaigns are about, right? We're, we're educating them about who we are and what we want to do for the country. 
and we want to elect an ethical government. That's the whole point of our campaigns and our uh, educational campaigns, right? <clears throat> but um, that's a big one. And that's what our uh, national public money system is about. But in the meantime, and in between cycles, and while we're organizing, we can educate the public about money. And we can do this by lobbying our local governments to begin issuing currency. And this is especially so if we are coming into depression. Because all, and, and with the lockdown, it's very much already here. And so in Tenino, Washington, they've already started issuing currency. They're issuing currency uh, just to be using in their city because uh, the businesses were out of money and they needed money in to uh, circulate in the um, local economy. And so, uh, of course, a lot of people are skeptical, is this gonna work? Well, it did in 1932 through 1939 uh, when uh, they were issuing local money and uh, helping citizens get through the depression. And they did so successfully and lots of cities did that actually during the depression. But these currencies are not very strong. Um, they're publicly issued, but they're not very strong because they're not the big, uh, they're not the national currency. But there was a local currency that was very strong. And we're going to talk about that one because that is a very revolutionary local currency. We're going to talk about the miracle of Wurgel. Now, Wurgel was a town of 4,500 people. It had, in 1932, it had 1,500 unemployed people out of 4,500 people, right? <clears throat> 200 were penniless and homeless, all right? Uh, 200 families, not 200 people, 200 families. And the mayor had been reading Silvio Gassel about stamp script. Now what stamp script is, it's local money that's issued with a little um, box on here that ha where you have to put a stamp on it every month for it to maintain its value. Otherwise it drops 1% in its value each month if you don't keep putting the stamp on. So it becomes a pure medium of exchange. It's not a store of wealth. What they would do is buy real wealth to make it a store of wealth, <laughs> uh, right? So, because it was kind of temporary in that regard. But they, because of, of that device, the money flowed very fast. People spent their money. When they got it, they spent it as fast as they could get it. They paid taxes in advance back in those, <laughs> in Morgul. They were paying taxes in advance because that money was coming right back as wages and buying the local produce and, and materials to uh, build 200 houses for those homeless people. They built a water reservoir, they built a bridge, they did uh, paving on all their streets, put in sewers and gaslight uh, lighting for their uh, streets. And, um, uh, run soup kitchens to, for, to feed everybody. Uh, they made sure that the public were taken care of. The local, local governments are the most likely uh, and are most in touch with the needs of the people, right? So this was very powerful. Now, it was, the word got out. People heard about this and there were uh, other communities in Austria, like 200 communities that wanted to do the same thing. And so the mayor of uh, Wardle went around and, and was talking to them, uh, telling them how to do it. Uh, another city uh, nearby started doing it as well. And, uh, you know, with immediate success. And when the uh, central banks, the big privately influenced and controlled central banks of Austria saw that, they said, no, that's, we're banning that. We're banning script. And they did ban script. And that plunged them back into depression. And that, my friends, is why they were so angry they elected a Hitler <laughs> over there in Germany. Because Germany had a similar experience with a, a local demurrage currency like this. Uh, that that uh, lowering of the value each month, just that little bit, 
is called demurrage. So it's very powerful. And there's another thing about it that's important to us greens. And that is the dynamics of net present value, how stamp script and a demurrage currency is affected by the dynamics of net present value. Because when you have debt money in the future, that money's worth less. But in this system, the money is worth more in the future. You know, so the value keeps going up towards the future. And so people in Wargle started thinking about the future just a few months into using this current. Wow, let's replant our forest out here. And they did. And they started thinking about um, um, other things about the future. Well, that ski jump, that was, that was thinking about the future, you know, when they're, because it was for their children, you know, the ski jump. And, uh, and the reservoir, well, they didn't quite need all that water yet, but they knew they would in the future, so they built this big reservoir. And so that's one of the things people start thinking long-term instead of short-term. And, and that's the kind of thing that greens need because we want to think about the future. We want to preserve the future. Right now, the capitalist system, the future is meaningless, completely meaningless to the capitalists. <clears throat> so this is how we pay for the world we want. And we do it by, we change the money. <laughs> and so I've got a little song about that. And it goes like this. Uh -oh. The whole world is in trouble now, everyone can see. Will human life continue? There's no guarantee. Understand the problem affecting me and you. We all need to focus on what we need to do. The big banks create credit, all our money as debt. And that is what is causing the inequity we get. Concentrating all the wealth and power to a few. Or don't you think it's high time we tried something new? So let's change the money. No better way to turn the world around. Change the money. What's gone up now must come down. So change the money it'll make our future bright it's all about the money now and it's time to do it right no more bursting bubbles no bailing out the banks money for production tell speculators no thanks we could lower taxes put money in everyone's pocket and that would make our economy and take off like a rocket and we could have an economy in a steady state and no more worries over the unemployment rate and no more corporate money choosing who we can elect and no more corporate lobbies with a congress we respect when we change the money no better way to turn the world around now change the money what's gone up now must come down so change the money it'll make our future bright it's all about the money now it's time to do it right now i know you're all thinking of the possibilities we could save the oceans replant all the trees have a quality of life beyond anything we've seen and no more war and conflagration and all our systems green so let's change the money and no better way to turn the world around now change the money what's gone up now must come down so change the money it'll make our future bright and help us through this night it's all about the money now time to do it right I love it that All you're right. not afraid to do a solo. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, I am solo here, so it's kind of <laughs> easy in that regard. I don't have to look at your faces making faces at me saying, oh, God. <laughs> Okay. So, all right. So now we have time to talk about um, questions. And there are a few questions stacked. The first one is John Krause from Louisiana. 
Do you want to uh, put out your question, John, or shall I read it off the chat? Yeah, I, I can read it out. I, I, I was Thanks. just curious as to why there's no not language in there advocating for nationalizing or switching to public ownership, all public banks. And it seemed that the platform amendment also uh, removed some language saying that social spending and social security and environmental spending kind of were on equal footing with reducing the debt. And I was just kind of curious why I removed that language. Is the question clear? Howard, Joe, Sue, can you hear the question all right? I think so. Um, what? I'd rather well, read it. Well, the first, uh, yeah, he said he agrees ahead, that the Fed should be publicly owned. And he asks, should we not call for public ownership of all the private banks? And then uh, he also all asks, the private banks. All the private banks. Then he also okay. asks, why did we remove the language from the debt platform plank that highlighted other spending priorities, like environmental changes and social services? Because he says, y'all seem to support that. Mm -hmm. Right. Who wants to take the first part of the question? Uh, I believe what we determined was that that was in the wrong place of the uh, platform. Right. It was it was spending, and so we were talking about debt, not spending, and so uh, that's the reason why it went to the spending part of the platform. And of course, it's already there in the spending part of the platform, right? And most of our platform is about spending. So that was the second part of the question, that why we didn't reiterate all our spending priorities. Oh, and banking, we don't want to privatize or make all the private banks public. Um, I think that would create a lot of uh, tension and, and um, bad feelings. But what we do is make them an honest business <laughs> by taking their money power away so they can't practice usury anymore. Uh, and they become basically, they're just become a small community business because those big banks are going to shrink um, because the, uh, they won't have the power to create massive credit like that. I mean, there are banks right now who the smallest loan that they make is a billion dollars. And uh, that wouldn't be happening anymore. And, and I would just add, today in the current system, banks are unique with this incredible power over all of us. Once the need act and greening the dollar takes place and the, the banks are just ordinary corporations. Right. When they can no longer create the money via credit. Sure. Yes. So um, John, does that more or less answer your question? Are we ready to move on to the next? I, I have one thing I'd like to add. No, so please do. <clears throat> um, yeah, we're talk, talking about in the future under, under you know, a, a public money system, um, there's no need to, uh, there's no need to uh, take away the power of the private banks to exist. Um, while, while, what will happen instead is all forms of other uh, forms of community type banks, um, expansion of, of credit unions, um, cooperative banks, special purpose banks, um, you know, banks that banks that are organized by people for the purpose of, of of carrying out the needs that they identify for the community, kind of like community development banks are today. So, so the point is that there will be a huge change in the banking industry as a result of public money, and it can happen without raising the specter of us uh, tearing down the doors of the banks to make them put a public stamp on them. And at the same time, and at the same time, the banks that are going to stay in business are going to be the ones with the sharpest pencils and the lending policies that the community wants. So everything about banking will change, um, but we will, but we don't advocate, you know, pri uh, to go and trying to publicize all the banks. Over. Just the Fed banks, the, <laughs> the twelve Reserve. Fed banks. Federal Reserve. Oh, Federal Reserve banks, right? Now, Ashley Rivera has a question regarding risk of issuing currency. I didn't quite understand it. Ashley, could you put your question out for us? Yeah, so 
Um, I was talking more about that we like which which banks and specifically because lots of these like um these like banks like Bank of America and like Citibank um like the more national banks like they um they like fund terrorism and like wars so like do we really want to like do we really want to like involve ourselves with them like. <laughs> I mean, I have a I have a Bank of America account, and I'm like thinking about switching to a um, one of those like public banks, like a a, um, a union credit or something like that. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's credit union, good move, Ashley. That will be a absolutely, good absolutely. And I had started the moving the money uh, campaign some years ago to try to get all Greens to pull their money out of the big banks and put it into credit unions and small community banks locally owned. And uh, that's what we should be doing. But when we take the money power away from those commercial banks, um, they're going to, uh, it's going to change their character big time because they won't have power anymore. <laughs> they won't be able to make those big loans. Yep. That'll be on us because we will be in charge of the budget. We'll be in charge of the money and we will be able to fund the needs of the American people, reparations, whatever it is we need to do. Because enough of this nonsense with, uh, you know, trillions of dollars going to a few people. That's ridiculous. Can't allow that to happen anymore. So that's what we're working against. And that's what our policy is about. But we don't want to uh, make them too mad. I mean, they already kill people for <laughs> trying to change the money. You know, every president that tried to do that was assassinated, you know. <laughs> Sue Stack. <laughs> Sue, please. Yes, by, by our plank greening the dollar, nationalizing the, federal re the 12 Federal Reserve banks, and then from the commercial banks taking their power to create what we use as money away from them, that means they can't fund wars is what they're doing now. They are using this power of bank credit to fund weapons manufacturers. Um, you name it. They, they, they fund these large corporations that oil companies. undermine our peace, our efforts at peace. So it's very critical um, if you're, a, if you're a, someone who works for peace to know how the power of these multinational corporations that are fund, funding the wars and making profits of, off our wars, why it's so important to go down to the level of these banks and stop them from giving power to these corporations. They, they give huge loans, billion dollar loan go, co goes from Bank of America to the, this weapons manufacturer. So we have, we have, we have to for peace. Yeah, Rita, stand. So yeah, we're going to stop that. <laughs> Go ahead, Rita. Um, one of the early questions here was, um, when we need it most, why does the U.S. financial system freeze up, as in two thousand eight? Will you say it again, right. please, Rita? <clears throat> When we need it most, why does the U.S. financial system freeze up as in 2008? Yes. Well, it is a, it is a uh, characteristic of that money system. Because uh, if you'll notice, every 10 to 12 years, we have a recession or a depression. And uh, I have a graph somewhere that shows that you know you can find it online that'll show gray lines it'll show the economy going along in a graph and then there's these gray lines and they represent all those depressions and recessions that we've had and the reason is because when the payments which is money being destroyed as sue explained are exceed the loans being made which is the creation of the money then there's a contraction of the money and so people don't have as much money, and that's why we have those uh, economic hardships every 10 or 12 years. Go stack. Go ahead, Joel. Well, real quick, just, you know, that's what the economists call the pro-cyclicality 
of the debt-based money system. And that is to say the cycle goes up quickly in expansion times when all the loans are made, all the debt is created. And then when it starts to go down, they, they reduce all the, the amount of money that's in circulation and it, and it, 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 it exaggerates itself. It exacerbates itself uh, until, you know, it gets to the point where uh, it can turn it, it can turn it around. And, and that usually takes, you know, a, not only a, a couple of years, but a, but a huge amount of the, um, of the uh, wealth that the borrowers have to put up in order to take out a loan. Um, I, I just want to mention this once because I think it supports everything that we're, that we're talking about. Hyman Minsky in his, in his uh, working paper number 127, which was titled uh, Financial Instability and the Decline of Banking. Uh, he identifies the fallacy of capitalism like this. During, during the expansion phase of capitalism, we need to create debt in order to have the prosperity. But during the turndown phase, there's nobody's job to make sure that we have the income to pay the debts that we created to create the prosperity. It's nobody's job. So if you don't have the income, the, the loans get lost, turned away, and, um, and the recession and, the, and, and, and depressions uh, follow. Over. Thank you. Another point that I think uh, that you touched on and I just wanted to highlight was that uh, when those recessions happen and people start defaulting on loans, where does their collateral go, right? You know where the real wealth goes. Oh, yes. And in 1933, millions of homes and farms, 4,000 banks all collapsed and went to the bankers. Hey, can you address the issue of um, crypto coins? Cryptocurrency like bitcoins and the well, other one? What place do cryptos have in this bigger picture? I what? Will. Joel? They are crypto. investment. Go ahead. Well, you know, crypto, you know, crypto. investments. <laughs> Go ahead, Joe. Okay, you know, cryptocurrency is not currency. Okay, it's, it's, it's a commodity. And, 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 and anybody can say that I want, this is going to be a coin. That just makes it sound like it's money, but it's not. In fact, this is even virtual commodity. So, so the idea of there being any role for a virtual commodity in a public money system is, is um, it, it's just nil. It, it, cannot, it cannot make either a contribution, nor can it, nor can it play, you will, um, with the with the with the United States money that's going to be that's going to be circulating, and there's nothing wrong with cryptocurrency, okay? But it's not money, and and um, and it's 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 for the people who like to gamble, really. That that that's what it's for. Over. I mean, it's as much money as regular money. No, money no it's kind of like a commodity. A commodity. Go ahead, it's kind of like. A com it's kind of like exchanging a commodity, as Bill or as uh, Joe was talking about. You know, it's 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 not a currency, it's not money, but it can be used as money, like a commodity. You know, so you know, if it was gold, you could use it for money because people would accept it as payment for something, and as long as people will accept it, um, then it can be used to pay for stuff. But not everybody's going to accept a Bitcoin. Yeah, I will add something here. The, the term legal tender means that it has to be accepted for taxes and in commerce. And to be real money, the money has to be legal tender, like the U.S. dollar. Cryptocurrencies are not designated by any country yet that I know of as legal tender. So somebody might accept cryptocurrency, but that doesn't make it money exactly. Does that help you? No. Well, Joe, lastly, um, any, uh, an, an agreement between two people, it could make anything money. It's, it's, right. an exchange, and it's an exchange and it's what you use to exchange and it's how you settle, how you settle the exchange. So, so exactly. in, in that sense, you know, cryptocurrency is money between people, but it's not money. It's not money in the legal sense of the term of what money is. Or, but what? money itself is a commodity. What we have to worry about is the fact that uh, all our knowledge about money comes from folk knowledge. There's no school telling you about money. 
It's That's all about true. independent research. It's all about independent research. And uh, there's no schools on monetary science. That's not now, true. Uh, if we keep making enough noise about it, they're going to happen. But uh, uh, you might tell me what school teaches about money. And how many people have been to school, a class on money, and learned all about uh, the creation of money and where it comes from? Joe Stack. Go ahead, Joe. Well, you know, I, I was given a talk at a class at uh, Virginia Tech a year or two ago, and I was talking to the money and banking class, the, the extreme, you know, advanced ones, the guys who were getting ready to graduate with their high degrees in money and banking. And during the talk, I said, I said, uh, you know, one of the problems is, uh, like Howard said, you know, the monetary system is not taught in any university or, or, or college in the country. And, and I said, but I'm sure that we all, all the people in this room know where money comes from, right? And there was only one person that raised his hand and said, yes. So if the people in the money and banking class don't really know where money comes from, because to them, it's, it's, uh, it's just dealing with numbers, uh, you know, in accounts, um, then it means that the, that the study of the system of money the system of money. To me, it's not money. It's not about, they don't teach about money. They teach a little bit about money. They don't teach about the system of money. Whose money is it? Whose system is it? Where does the money come from? How do we determine how, that the money meets the needs that the people are identifying out in the community to have in order to, in order to do what they want to do or need to do? So, so, so to me, it's not, it's, not a, it's not even a question. I mean, you know, you know, Donald Trump graduated from the Wharton School. It's kind of the highest school that there is for, for finance, not for money, for finance. So, so, that, so that's what it's all about. It's all about to, to me, the thing about capitalism is this. It takes money away from money, and it, and, it, and it puts capital in its place. When we say we want to have some money, and then they say, well, you, we, we have capital. Remember what the Fed guy said? We only have debt. When that's when we, when this is all over, we're going to have only money. Thank you. Um, folks, there's, there are still almost fifty of us here, and um, most have not said a single word. This would be your big chance. We probably have time for one or two other questions. If you would like to ask a question, feel free, or you can also always contact us through the BMRC email and we are happy to visit with everybody. Diana Little. <laughs> She's saying it's time to go home. <laughs> Just say I gotta go. I have plans with my niece. <laughs> oh, are, 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 you our, are you our webmaster, Diana? Oh no, um, that's Diana actually. I oh, okay. Uh, I am <laughs> Thank over you in the GPUS tile. Um, yeah, we can uh, wrap it up in about five more minutes because then I will turn off the recording. Go ahead. Great. I have a, I have a question. Susan S. Susan, yes. Uh, I, could you say more about the the Need Act or the what what does it say and who's sponsoring it and what is it doing and what can we do about it? A little bit more detail about the Need Act. Um, okay. Howard is screen sharing. That's a good question, Susan. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> yeah, a little more about the NEED Act. Uh, it is H.R. 2990 of the 112th Congress. So you can read about it there. Uh, you can just Google uh, the NEED Act, H.R. 2990, and uh, you'll be able to find it. And the three essential reforms that are in that NEED Act are also in the Green Party uh, monetary platform, which you can see here. And you can see it in our platform under um, um, the banking and insurance reform. And uh, of course, we have a new proposal that we're making monetary reform have its own section at the end there. Section E. Uh, but who, who, is, who is the, um, the thing about these three reforms is that, oh, it was Dennis Kucinich and John Conyers. 
were the uh, sponsor and co-sponsor of this bill. And uh, it spent three years in uh, legal counsel getting reviewed by the Congressional Legal Council and uh, getting grilled on, uh, on the law. And so uh, it was very carefully done and it is uh, considered one of the most revolutionary bills to have ever been presented to Congress uh, in 244 years. Joe Stack. Go ahead, Joe. Yeah, the politics of that, you know, uh, resulted in uh, not the assassination of Dennis Kucinich, but uh, his political assassination, if you will. Uh, he got gerrymandered out of the Congress in the following year. So, in other words, in other words, uh, uh, this is this is the bill. This is the bill to do the revolution that we want to do. And what we need right now to respond to your question is for each of us to go back to our states and our state uh, Congress people and to ask them to consider co-signing onto a new, uh, the same version of the bill. You could use the exact same version of the bill. Um, uh, like Howard said, you, you'd want to uh, 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 modernize the introduction because the introduction is the purpose and intent of the bill, of what it is that we want to do. And that needs, that needs an update of the data. But beyond that, it's all there. It's all there. Do you, a follow-up question. Do you think that the campaigns for public banks in various places around the country is, um, is what's left of this so no. far? Or is it going in the same direction? Or is it very different? Is that question clear? It is, it is different. But this it is, is, public, is quite quite public money. That's public banking. Right. Yes, oh, that's I, mean, I understand, but the political um, aspects of trying to get legislation or formation of a public bank is where people are discussing some of these matters. They may not, they're not discussing the federal reserve system, right. but right. that's, that's, right. what, that's right. what we have right now. And that's because they have, yeah. And that's because they are happening at state and local levels, right? And, uh, and, you know, we support that, um, that public banks are an okay thing, but they don't change the system, you see. It's, it's kind of a strategy for surviving within the current system. <laughs> Give us public banks so we don't have those fees to pay at our uh, local municipalities and stuff like that. Although a lot of municipalities already have a form of a public bank, uh, development banks and stuff like that, I think Joe mentioned. But the other, another point about the Green, uh, the uh, Need Act is that those three things need to happen all at once. They can't, uh, can't be done piecemeal. You can't just do one of those because history has already taught us why we need those three reforms done all at once. And, uh, you know, it was because, you know, banks have been nationalized, but if you don't nationalize the money, they, the banks, the private banks still control it. And uh, if you, national, if you uh, revoke um, the charter of the, the banks, uh, well, I'm sorry, I'm, I should be just reading the slide because I'd be more coherent. <laughs> but I hope you can read it. And if not, I can certainly send that uh, along to understand that um, important part. Thank you, it's very deep. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for the question. Yes. Thank you. There are actually two more questions. You want to try to do them? And I see Robin put up his hand, too. Here's a question from Matthew Andrews. Uh, maybe these might not be too in, involved questions. Have any other countries tried creating money this way, and how did it work? Oh, yeah. Um, well, at the beginning of World War I, um, England was in economic straits. And so um, they, they uh, somebody come up with the idea of issuing the, what they called the Bradbury pound. And that got their economy back on track with public money. And then the private banks took it back over once they got everything working good again. <laughs> <laughs> and then here's a question from Chris. There's Rich other instances of it as well. Yeah, yeah. that's one good example. Chris Richardson asks, 
do you mean that you want to get off of the petrodollar? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Can you say a little bit more about that, please, for me too? Want me to, to do that? Sure. Yeah, hello, Joe. The petrodollar oh, is why we are uh, all uh, having all these sanctions out here. This is, you know, all these countries want to get off the petrodollar, and we want to keep them on it. And uh, you get rid of the petrodollar, and all of a sudden, hey, no more need for the sanctions, for the most part. And, uh, you know, we, we are driving all of these countries into the arms of the Russians and the Chinese. <laughs> Yeah. Exactly what yeah. we're trying to and of course, there's and there's movements in each of those countries too for public money there as well. Right. And of course, that's what we need is kind of a global revolution because it's a global system. Just and that. so, you know, there's uh, the International Monetary Reform Movement has about 30 countries in it now with groups that are organizing to change their money system, their national money system. And of course, the U.S. is an important one because it's so powerful. Go ahead, Go ahead Joe. Joe. Well, first, I, first thing I want to say is, is that, yeah, there is a large international movement for monetary reform. Um, but what we need to do is to get the green parties in those countries uh, connected with the uh, with the you know the affirmative you know action by the by the state yes it's allowed to say it by the state to actually get involved in dis distribute uh, in issuing the money and when that happens you know this the whole the whole the whole concept of the of the petrodollar really stems from our great power after you know after the second world war and 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 we need to get away from there being any special superpower on the basis of money. And the only way that we can do that is to have everybody issuing their own money. And if you do that, the value of the money is the value of your national economy. It's not, as it was mentioned, you know, the country that gets to put the sanctions on everybody else because we're the biggest dude in town, you know, that kind of stuff has to come to an end. And that's what I meant when I said about the, having, having cooperative relationships and, and uh, you know, for, for, for the long term. They would be on the basis of cooperation, not on the basis of having the biggest club in, in the game. Over. By the way, I wanted to mention... Howard? <laughs> I wanted to mention we have a, a newsletter. The BMRC puts out a newsletter, and we'd love it if you would all subscribe to it, and uh, we'll just keep you up to date on various happenings in the world of money. And uh, we'll put it in the chat. Eugene Stack. Go ahead, Eugene. Uh, uh, public money was tried in the United States very prominently. During the Civil War, we were, you know, the North was near defeat. And it was only because Lincoln and some uh, members of the House Banking Committee, a guy from Buffalo, uh, decided to try something new and, and Lincoln was against it. The Secretary of Treasury was against it, but they were up against the wall and the bankers wanted 30% interest and they didn't have enough cash for all the equipment, the soldiers' salaries and everything that was needed. They tried greenbacks, it worked. And they put a, a limit on them, only $400 million, $450 million worth of greenbacks. And that's the number they kept to, it didn't lead to you know, the fear of uh, runaway inflation, et cetera. And it, after, after the Civil War, the private bankers had to take that power back because it was too good an example. And the populists in the South and West in the 1870s and 80s wanted to keep greenbacks. There wasn't enough money. The, the Wall Street bankers restricted the number of money and it was tough to survive. The railroads, were hammering, you know, and everybody was up against the working people. And the greenbacks were an answer, but that idea was allowed to be forgotten and destroyed as, as a key element of working class struggle. And the 
And then the uh, Federal Reserve Act in 1913 put the nail in the coffin of that. And that's what we got to overcome. And we got to champion the, the 1880s uh, populist. Read a book on the populist. Exciting stuff that they did. 20,000 people going to one spot and having lectures and so forth. Over. Yeah. Uh, okay. there's, there's more super cool questions here, but now we're really running out of time. Um, yeah, we, yeah. Someone says, weren't the greenbacks backed by gold? Short answer. No. 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 Right. <laughs> um, and then there's a question about um, the relationship of all this to the World Bank. I'm putting in the email address of our committee for you to continue submitting questions. We want to engage with you. Um, I wonder if Paul, uh, Howard, Joe, and Sue would each like to make one little final comment before we say goodbye. Joe, Stack. And I'd say one minute each, because I do have to stop the recording. So yeah. go for it. Thank <laughs> yeah. you, Diane. One minute, Joe. You're welcome. Okay, so, so re re really, thanks so much for, for, for being here and for us under these circumstances, you know, having this very important and very you know pertinent discussion and please consider how we might advance this further in the future because uh, because to me we should be having this discussion once a month so that we can get ourselves educated on the on the on the uh, the, the matters at hand and the importance of it thank you all very much very good howard yeah, absolutely. Thank you all so much for coming. I wish we were uh, all face to face in uh, for real in Detroit. It had been so much fun. It always is seeing all of you. I just love seeing you. Yes, you too, Kara, everybody, Henry. I, I know it's just, it's such a shame that we aren't able to get together this year, but uh, this is pretty revolutionary here, what we're doing and uh, let's keep it up. Yeah. I too want to give a lot of thanks to all the people who came to the workshop. Sue? Yes. Um, did uh, our, our website go up on the share screen? It did for a little while. Okay. Because I think, tell me if it's there. Um, it's there now. We have this wonderful, wonderful website that a bunch of greens put together over years. And it will, it has our newsletter on it. It tells you very simply what the problem is, what the solution is, and how to go to the solution called transition. And you can go to the history page, and you can go and read any piece of history about the, this private debt system is here from the beginning to the end. Thank you. Thanks to Sue, who made all those PowerPoints. All right. <laughs> Hey, they're incredible. <laughs> well, Thank all you. right. See you all soon. Thank you, Mary. Thanks. Yes. Thank you, Mary. Thanks to so. And Rita. Diane. Thanks to Thank Diane. You, Diane. Thank, Thank you, Diane. And to Thanks, all everyone. the people who came to this. So <laughs> Thanks, everyone. I really everyone. enjoyed hosting this. It's very informative. Stop Thank sharing you. your screen. <laughs> Okay. All right. There's everybody. Yay. Yay. All right. Well, it was nice to see all your faces uh, virtually.